In the OpenGL world, we are familiar with the concept of the frame buffer, which is where the rendering results go to. It is created together with the window in the OpenGL context when we call glfw create window. This specific frame buffer is called the default frame buffer, but we can also create user defined frame buffers for off screen rendering in techniques such as shadow mapping, deferred rendering, and others. In Vulkan, we actually have two objects that take up the responsibilities for the OpenGL frame buffer. These objects are the swap chain and the frame buffer, but don't confuse the OpenGL frame buffer with the Vulkan one. Despite the name, they are not entirely overlapping. It's a bit confusing, but I think it will become clearer as we make progress. The swap chain can be considered the lower level object of the two. It contains one or more images, which allows a double buffer setup or even more. It is responsible for defining the format of the images and the method by which an image moves from the application to the actual display, aka the presentation mode. Since the swap chain handles presentation on a window, it has to be tightly coupled with the underlying windowing system. Therefore, management of the swap chain is part of a Vulkan extension, and each operating system has its own extension. The frame buffer connects between the swap chain images and the render pass, which is yet another object that defines how exactly the images are going to be used, whether this is for color, depth, stencil, and etc. In this video, we will focus on the swap chain. Alright, before we dive deeper into the wonderful world of swap chains, I'd like to say a big thank you to Egil, who recently joined. Well, I used to call it the OpenGL Underground, but I guess I have to call it the 3D Underground now with Vulkan. Anyway, if you too would like to support this channel, you can do that at patreon.com slash OGLDev, or by joining the YouTube channel as a member. Okay, so we have a new method in the Vulkan Core class called CreateSwapChain. The main part here is a call to create swap chain KHR, which takes the device and a pointer to a create info structure and returns a handle to the new swap chain. This info structure contains quite a lot of stuff, so let's take it in small chunks. First of all, we have the surface handle which represents the actual window. The surface handle was created in tutorial number 4. So the swap chain is tied to a specific logical device and a specific window. Next we need to choose the format and color space for the swap chain images. Remember that for each physical device we store an array of the available pairs of format and color space. This array is of course specific to one surface, which happens to be the same surface that we are using for the swap chain. We have a helper function here, which traverses this array and looks for a combination of the BGRA8 sRGB format and the nonlinear sRGB color space. BGRA8 is pretty standard. It provides the full range of color with 8 bits per channel, plus a channel for alpha, and sRGB is supposed to provide a more accurate perceived color. Now, if this combination cannot be found, we fall back to the first element in the array. So now we can fill in the format and color space using the return value from the helper function. From the selected physical device, we also grab the surface capabilities structure. This structure contains the minimum and maximum number of images, the extent of the window, which is the width and height, and a bunch of other stuff. From this structure, we take the current extent and set it as the extent of the image so that it will match the surface. We also take the current transform and set it as the pre-transform of the swap chain. This attribute allows us to specify that some transformations such as a rotation or mirroring must be applied on the image before it is presented to the user. We don't want any of this right now, so we simply use the current transform, whatever that is. The surface capability structure also helps us determine the number of images that we will use. We want to do at least double buffering to avoid any tearing effect, so we request the minimum number of images supported by the surface, plus one. We must be careful not to request more than the maximum, so we have a check for that too. 
the final number of images is set into the structure. Next up is the presentation mode, which I mentioned very briefly in a previous video, so let's get into more details. In OpenGL, we use double buffering by default, rendering to one buffer while the other one is presented on the display and switch between them on every vertical blank. The vertical blank interval is a short period of time after one frame is fully presented and before the next one is grabbed. This is a perfect time to switch frame images because it avoids the very obvious tearing that happens if you switch frames before the current frame is fully presented. Or at least that was a problem back on the good old CRT displays. I'm not an expert on display technology, so I'm keeping this discussion at a very high level. From the programmer's point of view, the vertical blank is still a good opportunity to switch frames. In GLFW and OpenGL, we use the function GLFW swap buffers to switch between the front and back buffers, and this function will by default wait for the next vertical blank or vSync. So if the display is set to 60 frames per second and our application is able to complete rendering the frame in less than 1 60th of a second, which is about 16 milliseconds, we will achieve a steady state of 60 FPS. The mechanism of switching frames is known as a presentation mode and Vulkan provides six different options to choose from. The first one, the immediate mode, is very simple. It means that as soon as an image reaches the display engine, it is presented on the window. This can happen even outside of the vSync period, which, as we discussed, can lead to tearing in some cases. Now the cases where the immediate mode may be useful is in a first-person shooter, where the user specifically requests to turn the vSync off in order to achieve the maximum frame rate. Tearing in such high frame rates may not even be noticeable, so this can be considered a good trade-off. Another example is a benchmark, where you want to showcase the performance of the platform and the software. The point to remember about the immediate mode is that it provides the lowest latency possible. The frame doesn't go through any queue of images like the other modes. It goes directly to the display. The next mode is the FIFO, which stands for first in, first out. If you ever studied computer science, then I hope you didn't slip through the entire data structures class. In this mode, the system maintains a queue of images. The application adds images to the tail of the queue, and the presentation engine grabs the next image to be presented from the head of the queue. We will discuss how exactly the application gets the images to be rendered in a future video. For now it is enough to say that this mode provides the closest behavior to what we have in OpenGL, which is probably why this mode is the only one which is guaranteed to be supported. The next mode is called FIFO Relaxed. It is based on the FIFO mode with a small twist regarding switching frames on the display. In the regular FIFO the display waits for the vSync and then grabs the next image from the top of the queue. But if the application is late and there is no image, we have to wait for the next vSync for a second chance at getting an image. In FIFA Relaxed, we allow any image that arrives into an empty queue to be delivered to the display without waiting for the vSync. This of course may result in tearing, so bear this in mind. The last mode that I want to discuss today is the mailbox mode. It is also similar to FIFO in the sense that images go into a queue on their way to the display, and frame swapping happens only during vSync. The difference is that the queue can contain no more than one image, regardless the number of images in the swap chain. This means that if the swap chain contains three images, and we have image A on the display right now, and image B in the queue waiting for the next vSync, and the application has just finished rendering image C, then image C will replace B in the queue, so on the next vSync we will pick up image C. After this queue replacement takes place, image B is available for rendering in the application. What's nice about the mailbox mode is that it makes the display more responsive to the player's action while avoiding tearing. Choosing the best presentation mode depends on the type of game that you are developing, the type of responsiveness that you are trying to achieve, 
as well as whether the platform is mobile or desktop. Our physical device structure contains a vector of the available presentation modes, which is also specific to the current surface. The function ChoosePresentMode traverses this vector and chooses Mailbox if it is available. If not, the default is FIFO, which always exists. Now let's go quickly over the remaining few attributes in the CreateInfo structure. Image Array Layers is relevant only to a stereoscopic surface, so we set it to 1. The Image Usage attribute tells the system how we are going to use the images. For basic rendering, we have to allow it to be used as a color attachment, but we will also enable destination transfer for post-processing in the future. Exclusive sharing mode means that only one Q family can use it at a time. This is supposed to provide the best performance. The Q family index and the Q family indices is relevant only for the non-exclusive sharing mode, so we set it to 1 and the address of the Q family. The alpha compositing is set to opaque to ignore the alpha channel for now, and clipping is set to true. After the swap chain has been hopefully created successfully, we want to get the number of images that were actually created. This is because, for various reasons, the system may allocate less images than what we requested. We use this value to resize two vectors, images and image views. These are new private attributes in the class of the corresponding Vulkan handles, vkImage and vkImageViews. The image is simply the image that we've been discussing all along, but what is the image view? Before we get into that, notice that we have a second call to get swap chain images khr. The first one had null at the end, so we only got the number of images. The second call is with the address of the array of images, so we get the handles of all the images in the swap chain. Back to image views. So to make things even more complex, we can't access the images directly. We have to create an image view, which acts like a gate to the image. It allows us to access a subset of the image. For example, we can access a subset of a 3D image as if it is a sequence of 2D images. We have to create an image view for each image, so we have a helper function for that, which is called in a loop. It takes the logical device, the image which is referenced by this image view, the format which will be the same as the original image, aspect color bit means that we are using this as a color attachment, the type of the image which is 2D of course, the layer count and MIP levels are 1 because we don't have MIP mapping or multiple layers. The function createImageView is mostly a wrapper for the corresponding Vulkan function. We simply set all the parameters into their respective locations. The components attribute allows us to play with the channels and change their order, but we don't need any of this right now, so this is hard-coded to swizzle identity. And finally, in the destructor of the Vulkan core class, remember to destroy the image views, as well as the swap chain itself. And that's it for the swap chain. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.